It is a unique honor and privilege and personal pleasure to welcome Prime Minister Monti back to the podium of our Peterson Institute for International Economics. I think it's fair to say that a simple syllogism sets the stage for today's meeting. The future of the world economy depends critically on the outcome of the Euro crisis. The outcome of the Euro crisis depends very heavily on what happens in Italy, by far the most important country at the epicenter of those developments. And the outcome in Italy will turn decisively on the success of the new Italian government, led by Prime Minister Monti, both in overcoming its financial difficulties and in setting the prospects for sustainable economic growth over the longer run. I don't want to put too much pressure on our speaker by <laughs> putting it that way, but he and everybody else knows that he, his government, and his policies are truly critical to Italy, Europe, and the global economic outlook. And I believe it's also fair to say that no one could be in a better position to respond constructively and successfully to those challenges than Prime Minister Mario Monti. As European Union Commissioner for Competition Policy, we all remember he displayed enormous and repeated rounds of courage. He took on Jack Welch and GE. He took on Bill Gates and Microsoft. He took on the Landesbanken. Uh, he even took on our good friend who hasn't yet arrived, Sergio Marchione, uh, who co-chairs the Council on the United States and Italy, to which Mario has spoken many times, with whom we partner here and are delighted to work so closely. I think it's also fair to say that as EU Commissioner, particularly in his period for competition policy, he forcefully displayed his devotion to economic competition as a response and solution to underlying economic and particularly growth difficulties. And we all know that's what Italy as a nation and Europe as a region now needs more than anything else. And so again, Mario Monti is the ideal leader. In addition to all his enormous professional accomplishments, uh, Mario Monti has been a great friend of our Peterson Institute and think tanks more broadly. He has been a member of our board of directors for six years. He was the founding chairman of Bruegel, our partner and close friend institute in Brussels. And he's the only person, he may not know this, he's the only person ever to have delivered the two big annual lectures that we have in lecture series here at the Institute. And when he gave the second of those in 2006, his title was, Does Europe Have an Economic Future? His response was an unequivocal yes, but, he cautioned, only if Europe did several important things to keep its forward momentum toward integration going. And he stressed, in particular, the need for structural economic reform. Now, Prime Minister Monti is in the most important position possible to make that happen. It's therefore a truly great honor, privilege, and personal joy to host the Prime Minister <coughs> and to introduce him to this distinguished audience. Super Mario. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fred. It's uh, really very touching and uh, emotionally heavy for me to be here with so many friends and uh, so trapped by Fred's uh, syllogisms uh, about uh, the crisis, uh, uh, Italy, Europe, etc., etc., um, I didn't quite realize um, how 
tall and older um, thread would have been able to uh, put in front of me. Um, I, uh, I really want to underline how we all uh, involved in policy observing or in policy making have been benefiting from the Peterson Institute work and by and, and from uh, Fred's leadership in this and also in other broader contexts. So I think uh, there could be no better place for me to um, share uh, with a highly qualified audience a few reflections on this time the economic future of Italy and Europe. As uh, Fred mentioned, uh, yes, I delivered a few words in 2006 on the topic, does Europe have an economic future? Um, and uh, after all, uh, Europe uh, uh, did have an economic future, but I think that many of the questions uh, surrounding uh, uh, Europe uh, then uh, are still uh, there today. And of course, I feel the responsibility in my temporary and luckily enough sharply time-limited role as Prime Minister of Italy uh, to give a contribution to um, the solution of those problems. Um, the, uh, everybody has in mind, uh, of course, the Eurozone crisis. Um, I think everybody should be aware, and I think everybody in this room is aware, but not everybody in this country or in Italy or in Europe is aware of the fact that this has not been a crisis of the euro. The euro has continued to display very, very remarkable stability, solidity. It has uh, not incurred in any of the two situations in which a currency shows its weakness in terms of domestic purchasing power and in terms of external, uh, well, in terms of exchange rates. So I think it is uh, really remarkable that although there has been and partly there still is a, a banking and financial uh, and fiscal crisis in many uh, states of the Eurozone, the Euro has not been affected. I think this tells a lot about the structural, institutional and policy resilience of this very, very junior currency in terms of age in the global arena. Uh, now, it, just in the last few hours, we understand uh, that uh, substantial progress has been achieved in Greece uh, in order to overcome the uh, worst moments of uh, uh, the crisis. Um, and uh, I don't want uh, to uh, prejudge uh, anything uh, about what the, the Eurogroup and uh, the relevant uh, bodies will uh, decide on this, but let me just uh, uh, step back for a moment. Uh, the Greece case was, of course, the most severe and extreme and uh, limit case test than one might have imagined for the Eurozone. And uh, although we can easily point to the fact uh, that uh, much of what was set out for Greece as a program in terms of budgetary consolidation, in terms of structural reforms and so on, may have come too late, may have come in insufficient doses relative to the requirements, I think one day even the Greek case will be seen to be a, a proof of the value of uh, introducing throughout Europe the culture of stability that uh, invented in Germany, in post-war Germany, through the social market economy model has been through the euro, through the budgetary constraints surrounding the euro, has been spreading throughout Europe. Certainly a country like uh, Italy has benefited enormously in the mid and late 90s from the pressures 
to get into the euro uh, that uh, have brought uh, uh, very, very important uh, structural reforms uh, at that time already. And uh, the most recent economic and political experience uh, uh, in Italy, of which, uh, for strange reasons, I happen to be one of the components today, uh, would not have been there if it had not been for the continuing pressures exercised by the uh, framework of EU policy making. And if I were a German citizen, um, I would be uh, proud, even looking at Greece, of the fact that uh, the most successful of all heavy engineering products of Germany, the euro, um, through uh, the, its diffusion throughout Europe, has brought the principles of budgetary discipline, of the market economy, and of all that uh, to even the most uh, peripheral and culturally less prone, least prone part of Europe. So I think that uh, transformations that in, uh, in other times would have required, uh, I don't know, a generation are now, are now being put in place, I hope, I hope, in a non-reversible way, but this remains to be seen in just a couple of years. And that is because of the strength uh, of the cultural reference to the values of stability that the euro has allowed us all to share. Now, of course, the Economic and Monetary Union was a rather daring construction, but uh, a jigsaw where some key pieces were missing uh, when uh, I last was here to deliver a few reflections in 2006. As we know, it was both an economic and political project that was meant to complete the European single market. As I think I said on that evening here, uh, the uh, euro is meant to be the cherry on the cake of the single market, but many of the problems were coming from the fact that the cherry had been put in that position, but the cake was not yet completely there, <laughs> given the still very uh, imperfect stage of uh, European real economic integration. Now, the institutional framework of the Economic and Monetary Union is being reset to tackle the flaws in its design and operation that the crisis brought to the light. Most crucially, tools to resolve the crisis have been established within the European Financial Stability Fund, sorry, with the European Financial Stability Fund and the future permanent European Stability Mechanism. The rule book of the Stability and Growth Pact has been updated and enriched with sharper rules. Can I interject here the notion that one of the main uh, problems brought about by the euro area crisis has been the uh, resumption of uh, old stereotypes about uh, allegedly inherent and unchangeable characters of different people, sometimes constructed on the mere basis of the latitude of their countries. Uh, and of course it was uh, the two uh, originating forces of the Stability and Growth Pact, Germany and France, which uh, broke down its credibility in 2003, when they didn't quite like to submit themselves to the uh, enforcement procedures. And Italy, although not violating itself, the Stability and Growth Pact at that time, uh, provided a complicity in all this because it was Italy in the chair of the ECOFIN Council that allowed the two large member states to break uh, the rules. And after all, it took from 2004 to 2012 to rebuild again a credible pact. And of course, that was made even more difficult by the um, fiscal indiscipline 
in the meantime intervened, particularly in some southern countries, but uh, traveling on the wide open road created by the non-acceptance of the rules by Germany and France in 2003. So we all have a responsibility to build a better European integration and many, if not all, also have to share in the responsibility of having not always operated in the right uh, uh, direction. So I think uh, European integration can be built uh, all the better uh, the more we are all uh, modest uh, in assessing our performance relative to that of the um, other. The principles of uh, budgetary discipline uh, uh, are now or will shortly uh, be uh, enshrined in national constitutions and uh, the um, and uh, all member states have committed to be near to a balanced budget by 2015 so far the main focus has been uh, as it had to be on austerity and fiscal consolidation yet structural reforms are as important as fiscal discipline for the long term future of uh, uh, europe and uh, um, fiscal discipline rules and the commitment to sound public finances can help European member states overcome the, the, the blocking powers of lobbies and special interests. Uh, these uh, vetoes hampered reform in the past uh, and led to national uh, abuse of the imperfection institutional framework of the Economic and Monetary Union. But fiscal adjustment is not sufficient, definitely, and uh, the interesting uh, uh, current stage of uh, the policy game in Europe is precisely on how uh, to put to rest uh, the concentration of minds and policy energies uh, on uh, fiscal discipline, putting them to rest, not because fiscal discipline will not, to, will not have to be observed, but because by now it has been uh, really set in, uh, in a very, very sophisticated constitutional framework, both at the EU and at uh, the national level, and all the enforcement instruments are there, and all the political will to comply with them is there. So this is a very um, uh, interesting moment for uh, all of us to concentrate more on the uh, growth uh, imperatives. Uh, of course, uh, uh, how can growth uh, be generated in, in Europe in a, in a context of continued budgetary uh, discipline? Um, I think most of the extra growth uh, will have to come uh, maybe by coordinated macroeconomic policies at the G8, G20 level, but as far as the EU is concerned, uh, mainly uh, it will have to come from uh, uh, structural reforms or supply side measures within uh, Europe. Uh, this means that uh, we have now to really work on the cake, to make the cake more similar to the uh, optimum currency area that we see in the textbooks, otherwise the euro will never, although being a solid currency, will never deliver its potential in terms of economic uh, growth and uh, uh, well-being. Uh, but in order to make the cake a real cake, uh, we need to have a single market. Although we come out, I mean, relative to when we were here together, many of you and, 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 and I in 2006, since then, the single market has been in crisis, not in further development. Why? Because the um, the, the backlash against integration or the integration fatigue that has, has been observed in many EU countries has put more and more in question the uh, adjective, the single 
We have seen concerns in France concerning uh, uh, an army of Polish plumbers that apparently were ready to come to France. And we have seen in many countries increasing resistances towards uh, uh, um, cross-border takeover bids. And we have seen in many, many countries a growing uh, uh, economic uh, uh, nationalistic sentiment and all that. So the single market uh, has, has uh, been less and less a uh, wished for development and more and more a resisted development. But even the noun, the market, has been somewhat in crisis because many in Europe, following the financial crisis, have been putting in question intellectually and politically the notion whether the market economy was, after all, the best vehicle to generate growth and employment. So not an easy time for a single market, let alone for a global <coughs> European economic policy which wanted to bet on a stronger single market. But now I think we are really at uh, the moment where uh, we, we have to work in that direction if we want to make uh, uh, growth uh, a reality in Europe. And as I uh, hinted already uh, six years ago in, in this room, the paradox is that there are many uh, countries within the Eurozone, therefore, uh, which live the life of uh, the monetary union, which, however, uh, do not really do very seriously their job as regards economic union, because uh, in many continental countries, uh, large continental economies which are key to the Eurozone, we find less uh, compliance with the rules of the single market of competition, of market openness, than we find on the average in countries like the UK, Denmark, Sweden, Poland, and these are all countries which do not belong to the Eurozone, but which uh, uh, are more compliant and more indeed uh, intellectually in line with market principles. This can perhaps explain why my government in Italy is investing a lot in, of course, making use of the fact of having been readmitted to the meetings with the, the heads of governments of Germany and France uh, and to play with them in order to provide impulsion to EU processes. But uh, we invest, uh, I would say, more than uh, uh, either of these two in the relationship with the UK, uh, with Poland, that is, with countries which, although not belonging to the Eurozone or not yet belonging to the Eurozone, can put pressure on us for us all to uh, become uh, a bit more of an economically integrated uh, real entity and real single market. And I think it's really a pity, not because we proposed uh, the thing, but because I think it would have been helpful if Prime Minister Cameron, uh, on the occasion of the European Council on the 9th of uh, December, where he finally decided not to stay on board the fiscal compact agreement, uh, he, he did not go down the road that uh, we had suggested for Britain, namely, do ask for a price in order to stay on board a treaty which is politically painful for you to ratify at home. But please ask for an acceptable price, like a strong commitment on the part of uh, the Eurozone countries to accept uh, which should have been in the interest of the UK and the other non-Euro countries, a big movement forward with specific deadlines concerning the single market for energy, for services, etc. But please don't ask for conditions that we could only reject because they would be regressive relative to the process of integration, like exactly what he asked for, namely uh, namely um, uh, the, the unanimity rule on any future uh, decisions on financial regulation, which uh, 
we could not accept uh, and was not accepted. But this is uh, just an observation on the link between the, the, the policy cooperation lines uh, uh, that uh, can be established within the EU and uh, the different degree of uh, uh, adherence to the key elements of, uh, of this composite set of countries, the fiscal discipline, growth, the single market, etc. Let me uh, come to a conclusion by saying that if a country wants to be coherent, if it pushes at the EU level uh, in order uh, to see a concrete policy with deadlines, which we hope we will get to, in order to stimulate growth through more single market, among other things, then that country has to be coherent domestically and not only will have to comply with the budgetary rules, uh, but will also have to be even more insisting on structural reforms domestically so that it can have a market which can cope with the challenges of being in a more and more a real single market. These are the two lines, budgetary consolidation and more structural reforms, that uh, our government uh, is uh, committed to in Italy. Uh, I kept uh, the uh, objective that my predecessor, Prime Minister Berlusconi, had uh, set in agreement with the ECB and uh, the European Commission, and that was done last summer in a moment of extreme financial emergency for uh, Italy. Only this, I believe, can explain the fact that the Italian government had accepted to balance the budget by 2013, which means a couple of years before the other um, member states. Uh, and uh, after a very quick reflection, we decided to stick with that commitment, although some macro economists uh, would uh, contend uh, that uh, that uh, was the optimal course. Uh, but I think uh, from a political point of view in Europe, we would have lost uh, any authority and ability to influence developments if we had uh, presented ourselves uh, first with a demand for more leniency. So we uh, put together quickly a package uh, adopted by decree law and then quickly converted uh, into law by the Parliament to achieve this balanced budget by 2013, which will imply, by the way, a five uh, and a half, 5.5% uh, of GDP primary surplus, so net of interest payments, which will be the highest in the euro area. And we have introduced uh, uh, by decree law, something un unheard of uh, in uh, Italian, but also in other member states, uh, most of them uh, history of structural reforms, through decree law, a structural reform of the pension system, going into a fully contribution-based system, and with the increase of the uh, retirement age to 67 for men and women uh, by 2017. Um, this was done by decree law with only three uh, hours of, of general strike, uh, which means that, uh, no, 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 I, I say this not to denote the weakness uh, of the labor unions, they are not weak, but I want to stress the maturity of the Italian public opinion, including the, the labor unions, which uh, accepted a major I mean, President Sarkozy could, n could not believe that we had, without people in the streets for weeks, done that uh, uh, structural reform. And then we proceeded uh, in the month of uh, uh, January uh, to uh, a package again by decree law um, in order, and this would be the, the politically perhaps most uh, difficult, but uh, we will see uh, in the next few weeks. I think we will bring home the conversion into law by the Parliament with minimal changes to the package uh, to, to really introduce much more competition and uh, opening up in, the, in areas ranging uh, from the liberal professions to the 
to a topic that one gentleman at one of these tables has been following uh, very closely with uh, a high degree of uh, um, of uh, um, responsible uh, awareness mixed with concern about the unbundling between the gas generation and the gas um, distribution um, systems. So all things going uh, in the direction of more, of more competition and uh, openness, uh, which uh, I believe could only be done uh, uh, through a very strange government like the present one, uh, which, as many of you will know, does not enjoy a structured majority of a coalition of parties, but enjoys or has so far enjoyed the uh, concomitant support in Parliament of parties which hardly speak to each other, coming as they do from a, high, a highly belligerent uh, past but they are supporting this effort. But of course, they support this, eff uh, this effort only if whatever we do, budgetary consolidation or structural reform, is bold enough and politically costly enough. Because number one, these are the things that they admit they could not have been putting in place. And secondly, if uh, uh, a party from the right uh, uh, has to support uh, a reform uh, uh, squeezing out some rents from the liberal professions which are in their constituencies, they will accept this only if we do a pension reform, for example, uh, in, in, uh, in the area which is uh, more a constituency of uh, the left with, with uh, equal uh, boldness. So there is a a virtuous mechanism of distributing pains in a, in a uh, in an homogeneous way, uh, which makes, uh, which ensures that uh, uh, we maximize the number of people who are unhappy, <laughs> but at the same time we seem to have, uh, for the time being, convinced the public opinion at large that these were necessary things and for reasons which I cannot really understand the general trust of the government policy seems to be supported by a very high percentage of the public opinion, which, uh, which opens up, in my view, a very optimistic consideration about the Italians. Namely, it's not that they resist being governed. They had a pent-up demand for governance, it was the political system that perhaps was a bit hesitant normally to uh, supply that governance, that decision making, that after all the people were ready and maybe willing to see in place. Uh, f final, final point. Uh, uh, I think there is a continuity. I, uh, I forgot, I don't want to give anybody the impression that we forget the labor reforms. Uh, this is the third big pillar. So budgetary consolidation, liberalizations and competition and labor reform. There we cannot, uh, even, even we cannot uh, and do not intend to proceed by decree law. So there are negotiations going on. They will be concluded by the end of March. And they will, uh, uh, they are being oriented in the direction of uh, um, reducing. Uh, this is something the the IMF, the EU, the OECD have always recommended to Italy: reducing the segmentation of the labour market, reducing the uneven treatment between the uh, insiders and the outsiders who cannot get in, mainly the young. Uh, and also changing the nature of some social uh, social protection mechanisms so as to uh, reduce a bit the distance uh, between Italy and some Nordic countries in having uh, more uh, flex security, namely a closer uh, compatibility between a labor market made more flexible 
and a modernized system of uh, social protection centered on the individual worker but not on the individual job as was the case for so many decades now this ladies and gentlemen cannot be uh, a um, of course it cannot be an unbiased report that i am submitting to you because i'm certainly very very uh, biased although uh, i as well as my ministers no, I, could not, I was saying that uh, I am a dilettante like my ministers, but we have with us here the foreign minister. No, we, we, we should have had the foreign minister, but he had a meeting at this time with the Secretary of State. Cert, certain of, of the ministers are, are by no means dilettante, but at any rate, <laughs> um, most of us uh, are. Um, but uh, we, we are putting together this uh, strange uh, experiment uh, um, and we cannot say of course how the final results uh, uh, will be but we do feel that uh, uh, without uh, the, um, the exaggerations uh, with which uh, Fred Bergsten uh, uh, politely uh, started his introductory works, words without these exaggerations but we feel that there is a link between the degree in which Italy succeeds in shifting from being a problem to being an element of a solution. And I think we are rather advanced in that. Uh, but above all, the, the degree to which uh, this experiment will prove successful in Italy and uh, the degree to which uh, Italy will uh, be able to exercise influence on the overall course of uh, EU uh, policy making towards, uh, towards a compact for growth in a fiscally compacted Europe and uh, I feel, we feel that there is a great uh, similarity of uh, uh, feeling and of uh, policy perspective between the US and the EU in this respect and this is an additional um, huge uh, uh, reason of interest and commitment on our part in being uh, in Washington today and I hope that although I've been exceedingly long, Fred, uh, there will be some time for us to be able to benefit from your and uh, the other guests' uh, uh, critical remarks and suggestions. Thank you very much.